I wish you all an interesting conference. I think I also have to mention that we have a film crew here today, so be aware of that. But right now, thank you very much, and I would like to give the floor to Professor Thea Hillhorst. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. As uh, has been extensively said, my name is Thea Hillhorst. I'm from Wageningen University, one of the partners in this research. And um, to me, the noble task to tell you something about our findings. And um, first, I would like to give a little bit of the background of the idea of the link that we are trying to, to, to explore between service delivery and state legitimacy. Where would there be that link in the first place? Service delivery is actually one of the primary phases that people see from their governments. What do you see from your government? except maybe you hear about it, but what is the government in your everyday life? And then, of course, much of what is government could be actually what government gives to you, what it delivers to you in terms of services. So there came this quite strong uh, attention to the service delivery ability of states with the idea behind it that better service delivery will create a better legitimacy of the state and hence will encourage peace. Now, I think that this course was partly a reaction to some decades that we had in the 1980s and 1990s, where, uh, due to disappointments again with the development state of the 1970s, we saw increasingly attention given to NGOs as better performers for service delivery. So, to some extent, I think around the turn of the century, there was a certain evaluation in the back of people's mind partly also inspired by what then happened in Afghanistan, where you saw that there was a lot of parallel service delivery going on, where NGOs were basically doing the service delivery and the state almost got sort of in the shadow. The very small example, when I was in um, Rwanda, 1999, in Niamata, with a beautiful program of an international NGO that did the whole agricultural extension and water services in the whole region of Niamata and had around 40 cars available to do their work with. And then I went to the state, the local government, and they had two motorcycles without petrol and all the extension workers could never go to the field because they didn't have the means to do it. So that was for me a very strong illustration of situations that were evolving at that time and where you feel, okay, something is wrong. Which is, of course, in a way a bit strange if you see how our own societies have evolved, where actually we have increasingly accepted that it's not the state who delivers the services, but it's the state who makes sure that services get delivered, but that are increasingly privatized and all that. And then we see, of all places in fragile states, that suddenly we have expectations if the state itself would actually be capable to deliver all those services. Uh, for example, in DRC, it's not the state that is delivering education and health. It's the church has ever been. In uh, other areas, it may even be real state competitions. It may be rebels, rebel groups that deliver services, hoping, because they also know that there is a link with legitimacy. So hoping to, to get some legitimacy for their own cause. And of course, we have ranges of NGOs, international NGOs doing service delivery, and perhaps also traditional structures that are engaged in all kinds of services. All happening through and sometimes along each other, sometimes competing with each other, sometimes collaborating with each other. So we talk in our research about multi-stakeholder processes, which are initiatives with the notion of bringing together different actors from state, civil society and private sector who have an interest in a problem and engaging them in a process of dialogue and collective action to address this problem. Now, this is a beautiful definition of a beautiful working relation that may evolve between different actors. And it's true that people who work on MSPs, there are quite a lot of us around the world at the moment, they usually have an idea not simply descriptive, this is service delivery that is just happening and we have different actors involved, but there's always a slight normative or perhaps idealistic connotation with MSPs that actually this working together <clears throat> may result as well in, in, in a kind of collaborations where 
the, the value of the collaboration is a little bit more than just simply the service delivered, but the value is also expressed in terms of the relations of those different stakeholders that they have together. Now, in our research, one of this, this was one of the tensions, because on the one hand, we follow this definition in the sense we were also looking for initiatives where there was a, some kind of a deliberate intention to improve state-society relations through service delivery. At the same time, we wanted to maintain a more descriptive um, quality of, of a more descriptive inroad into this area. And we said, well, it is not true that it's only the directed project programmatic MSPs that we want to look into, but we will also want to look into service delivery arrangement that, that have sort of more evolved and where very often the so-called partners have no idea that they are partners in an MSP. Because there is, of course, this huge diversity. There are uh, MSPs that, as I just said, they are really organized. So there is, it's, it's a project-oriented MSP where a donor works out an idea of how this service delivery can be done with complementary roles for the state, the NGO, the community, of course, is involved, and what have you. It's all sort of planned, designed. And on the other hand, we just find in practice all kinds of arrangements that just happen and that uh, may actually be rather informal. So there's also the whole range between really formalized MSPs that have an MOU to work together to rather informal, just happening on the ground arrangements. We also make here a distinction between MSPs which are really instrumental meaning they want to do service delivery. And if you have to work together to do it, you just have to work together to do it, but you want service delivery. And MSPs that have a more transformative objective and actually are more governance oriented. And that happens quite a bit. In our sample of the 12 MSPs, the far majority had actually this kind of additional or other objectives inspired by ideas of state society strengthening, peace building, to have actually an additional objective in terms of improving governance, improving state society relations. This is a research question which you just saw, but we will just repeat, repeat it because that guides the day. How do multi-stakeholder processes for the improvement of service delivery affect those services and how do they affect the legitimacy of state institutions? The first part of our question, how do they deliver how they affect the services, we thought it is important to also, our interest was in legitimacy, that's the interest of the network as well, but somehow we feel it's also quite important to ask by the end of the day, so did you get water or did you get electricity? It matters too, you know, it's not just about the governance and things like that, you want to know whether they have a road or not. So we looked at that question, but at the same time I must say these were rather brief case studies, very interview based, so we didn't do like a proper uh, evaluation of, it was not an evaluation study, so we didn't do really proper evaluation of outputs, impacts, effects of those programs or MSPs, but our value, whether or not they were successful in actually delivering the services, was done on the basis of the interviews. So we asked a whole range of stakeholders whether they considered the MSP had delivered its objectives. So usually the people who are in the MSP were always, would always very enthusiastically about the delivery of the objectives, but we of course also asked stakeholders around that, that question. Now the second part of the question, how do they affect the legitimacy of state institutions? That was uh, one of our questions which we thought interesting. Like if you have this assumption that state delivery, uh, no, sorry, that, that service delivery by states directly will enhance the legitimacy of the state, what happens in these kind of arrangements where the state is taking part, but perhaps not having the central part, maybe on the background, can such loose arrangements or more formalized arrangements where non-state and state actors sort of do service delivery more or less together. What is the effect of this for the state, for state legitimacy? Can we still see somehow that it is good, just to put it bluntly, is it good for a state to enter in this kind of arrangement if it wants to advance its own legitimacy? Or should it 
perhaps just stay away from these kind of things because they will lose out anyway. Now, when we look at these multi-stakeholder processes, what we do is uh, we uh, look at three aspects, which we call um, the input, the throughput, and the output, where the input are so basically how do you set up, how is the setup of the MSP, who's involved, who are the actors, who takes the initiative, what are its objectives, who funds it, what is the scope, what do they do. The throughput is more the process by which things are happening. Is this MSP inclusive? What is the divisions of roles in practice? How do decision making, how does it happen? How does accountability happen? The formal level of formalization, is there indeed, this is the agreement we have and we do it like that, or is that just an agreement on paper? So that's more the process. How do you do the art of MSPing? We call it in one of the workshops for today. Then we have, as the, on the output, we have what are the achievements of the objectives, what is the capacity development, what's the effect on policy, and whether or not there is a, a level of sustainability. Would this MSP survive after the project is ending? One of the very important questions, of course. So we looked at all these three aspects of MSPs. And the services we looked into is the basic utilities, we call them. So that would be drinking water, waste management, electricity and infrastructure. Diederik just gave you the division. Eh? We had actually quite a lot of water-related projects. Eight out of 12, two roads, one electricity and one waste management. Now, the way we uh, look at MSPs, um, sort, of, sort of from the theoretical background we bring, is we look at MSPs as arenas, which means that uh, the realities and outcomes of services depend on how actors interpret the context, the needs, their own roles, and each other. It means, if you take such a perspective, that you find it very important to sort of have deep qualitative interviews with people around an MSP. That's basically uh, the effect of this choice, because when you assume that you have an MOU, these are the objectives, and then you just simply want to see whether the objectives are reached, you can have a, a research, up, uh, research strategy which is pretty straightforward. It's almost ticking off the boxes. Eh? Has it been reached or not? I have my indicator, now I measure it. Yes, no. Whereas if you take an arena perspective, you, you are already assuming beforehand that people are people and they will start to bend everything towards how they see what is important. Every agreement is only an agreement in as much as it is being implemented, in as much as it is being understood. It's really nice to have things on paper, but by the end of the day, it's how people understand the arrangement that they have and act upon it. That is what can make a difference for service delivery or not, not the fact that we have that agreement. So we want to look more what happens in practice, how do people understand it? And of course, in people's understanding, there's a certain interpretation. Everybody is a researcher, so they will interpret the, what is happening in terms of the agreements they have, they will interpret it in terms of their own context, what is feasible, what is, oh yeah, that's agreed, but in reality we know we will not be able to do it because ta 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 ta. And of course, there is also people's interest. People walk into an MSP not innocently. They have also their own ideas, their own notions, what they want to achieve for the, for the services, for legitimacy, but also, of course, for themselves, as we all do in every kind of arrangement where we work. Let me go to the functioning of the MSPs, what we call um, now the MSP input. Now, what we find is that uh, if you look to the different actors that form the MSPs, the more dominant actors invariably are the NGOs, civil society we call here, but the NGOs, but sometimes also depends a bit how you define NGOs. It could also be a church institution um, and state institutions. They are also quite active. In, in 11 out of 12, there was the presence of the state in the MSP. And uh, they did include beneficiary communities Interestingly enough, we didn't find among these 12 any MSP that included also private actors. Maybe we didn't look well enough. We didn't say, okay, we need a few MSPs that have private actors involved, but we still found it striking because it would have been so logical and we read it everywhere. And 
Interestingly, in many countries, the privatization of service has been an issue. Look in Bolivia, water issues, etc., etc. But here we found actually in these four countries very few instances of the privatization of services where they evolve in MSPs. Now, what we also find interesting is that whether it is initiated from the top down or the bottom up did not significantly affect the governance of the MSPs. What we mean here is that in the literature on MSPs, there is always a lot of ado about that it is important how it starts. And the idea is if it starts top down, donor driven, there is resources, it's a project, but there is not the kind of constituency that a sense of ownership can develop. Whereas if it is bottom up, there is a sense of ownership, but then it misses often the linkages to effect effectively engage with higher up actors. That's the literature. We didn't find that back in practice. And I think it's perhaps related to the fact that there were these preceding histories of collaboration and not. We didn't find that those that were really sort of donor driven from outside were different, qualitatively different from those MSPs that had a more grounded uh, history. The majority of these MSPs incorporated governance, coordination, management, awareness raising, etc. in their own objectives. Meaning they had objectives which were slightly more than simply let's get people water, let's get people electricity, but there was something there as well in the objective saying we can work together and we can create a different kind of governance arrangement around service delivery. And finally, what we find is a really, really high donor dependency. Um, the whole idea of cost recovery services, etc. we haven't found it. There is basically, they basically, really, most of it depends on external funds to keep the services going. When we look at the functioning of the MSP, the throughput, what we find is that MSPs are indeed inclusive, as I say. They all have... Uh, user committees involved, other forms of uh, community committees that are represented in the MSP. And they are there and they do participate and it's there, it is inclusive. At the same time when we look at things like the decision making and the real governance in practice, it is still very hierarchical. It's basically the NGO who is coordinating, who, who sort of uh, decides how things are being done. So here it is who pays the piper calls the tune. People f really think if you ask them who steers this MSP, it is the donor or the what they consider the representative of the donor. The may not be the back donor, but the one who brings the money to the MSP. Um, there are, we find everywhere internal accountability, or in most MSPs, there are internal accountability structures. So it's pretty well arranged how it is being done, again on paper, yet in practice, and to no surprise of us, because it's also part of real life in MSP. In reality, they tend to become politicized, and we found many instances where they actually got politicized in the sort of what we think of politics with the big P, in the sense that politicians will come out in election time and suddenly be very interested in an MSP and, and promise some services that then later will not be delivered. So in that sense, politicized, but also at a much lower everyday small p level, it's also politicized in the sense that you, that you feel that sometimes there's competition between the different actors who are supposed to work together on account of preceding histories of antagonism or simply because they all want to sort of stand forward and all find their own ground for legitimacy among the population. Formalized, they are formalized on paper, so usually on paper there is something like an MOU, but the realities are different. Like, also interestingly, um, we also find, for example, there are supposed to be meetings, official meetings, and then, uh, this is an example from Nepal that comes to mind, then there are supposed to be these official meetings and then you ask, it turns out there were no meetings. So you start to think, oh, hmm, why would you agree to have meetings and you don't have meetings? But then if you probe another layer deeper, it turns out that they actually meet each other, but never during the meetings. They meet each other at other occasions where they all are together and there they discuss their MSP stuff and they don't bother because they just meet each other. 
so they don't bother to actually also have a meeting with an agenda and it's opened by somebody and closed by somebody. Let's talk for a while on the impact of MSPs on uh, service delivery. As I said, we are interested as well, by the end of the day, do people get their water or their electricity out of service deliverers? And um, <clears throat> we find that the majority reach their objectives. So we can say these MSPs have a positive effect, a modestly positive effect on service delivery, we called it. At the same time, we have there this little, uh, or that, that uh, you have to remember the way we measured it. Eh? This is according to the stakeholders within and outside the MSPs. We haven't actually had the resources to actually go around to do a proper evaluation of these projects. Um, what we found, one of the most interesting findings of this whole research is that um, the output of MSPs are highly dependent on the throughput of MSPs. So whether or not an MSP reaches its objectives depends a lot on that box that I put a while ago in the middle where you talk about the process, the how, how MSP is being done. That is what ultimately defines success or not. And it's an important realization for us because if you look at the agreements underlying MSPs, you don't find much about this throughput function. What you find is that it seems like uh, the, the inventors of the MSP are already happy to have all the actors together and to have somehow an agreement of what they are going to do. And then how it is actually being done is not giving very much attention in the initial agreement. And uh, that might be one of our recommendations later, to just put a bit more emphasis on that. Now, lack of sustainability <coughs> is actually quite striking. Uh, quite a lot of these MSPs are set up as a project. So there is money for three years to deliver this and this and that to the community. And then for the occasion of the project, people are put together and with an MOU and all that. But do we find also evidence that there is already a thought of how are you going to maintain your services and how are you going to deliver them in the future? And how are you going to institutionalize the relationships that you have been able to establish in the project? And that is an afterthought. So we don't find these MSPs from the start a notion, a vision of how they are being going to be embedded in the local institutions that stay. So MSPs are too often defined as something that just sort of built for the occasion. And then uh, there is a problem also with the capacitation of the actors. If you want to do proper follow-up, there has to be real attention on how people, the capacities that actors need to do that follow-up, which is not always there. And then the very tricky one, the lack of cost recovery. And that is a very difficult problem because there is, we had a long discussion about this in Burundi during the workshop. Because on the one hand, there is this idea that services to be sustainable on the long run, they have to be cost there has to be a sense of cost recovery. There has to be some sort of self-financing aspect in them. At the same time, in many of the areas where we worked, the, the, the vulnerability of people, the poverty, and all that sort of would, all, would probably qualify way too many of them for free services. So you cannot, you cannot ask people who have nothing to pay for their services. So there is this, this, this very complicated trade-off between actually servicing your primary target group of really poor, destitute people and aiming for cost recovery in your services. The state legitimacy. We just call it now very simple. It's the acceptance of a governing regime as correct and appropriate. There's something about legitimacy that uh, it's what is being done is, is right, but it's also being done by the right actors. It's appropriate that the government is doing this or that or the other. So it's the acceptance of a governance regime as correct and appropriate for that situation. Appropriate that it deals with what it is dealing with. Now we broke the concept of legitimacy down. We took that from the OECD. Or was it the UNDP? Where is Irna? OECD, yeah? Yeah, yeah OECD. And it's the general embedded legitimacy, which is acknowledgement and acceptance of the state as such. And interestingly, I found that one of the very interesting things everywhere, no matter how malfunctioning the state, people have a sense of stateness. 
And uh, even if the state, like the state, oh, they have never done anything for us, but nonetheless, there is a sort of notion in the back of people's mind what a state is or should be. Then we looked into process legitimacy, how services are organized, governance, performance legitimacy, if they are organized, implementation and international legitimacy, whether a uh, state can make use of international resources and also whether it is um, uh, recognized as such. When we look at the MSP impact on state legitimacy, um, we find in one third of the cases out of 12, we find some kind of signals, indications that the MSP actually work towards legitimacy of the state. In one case, we found that it worked against legitimacy of the state, and all the others were sort of undefined. Did something really happen towards legitimacy or not? Or it was very mixed, like we see something happening in a positive sense, we see something happening in a negative sense, so you don't really dare to draw a conclusion of the final effect. Now what we find is that, especially at the level of process legitimacy, we find some effects, which is of course very much corresponding to our other finding that the, that the uh, actual service delivery objective achievement depends very much on the throughputs of MSP and that is also where we can find where we find it more effects on the legitimacy so what we sort of tentatively conclude here is that service service of quality is necessary but not sufficient so this is interesting eh, and important because there are so many programs that simply assume that if you get the water there if you get the electricity there that will automatically result into a higher legitimacy of the state. And what we think our, our findings show is that, yes, you must have your electricity and your water delivery, but by itself, it will not necessarily translate in that people change their, their uh, notions about state. We think it depends very much on the MSP throughput, the internal accountability, communication, information sharing, and the significance of the role of the state, whether or not we see some of these legitimacy effects coming up. Now, what we find is, when it comes to legitimacy, that MSPs are definitely no magic legitimation bullets. One of the things I really resent in, in, in the development, and I have been around for several decades, is there is always a magic bullet. Eh? First it was the NGOs, they have to do it, and then it is the state that can do it. And then we see, well, maybe we should go for the MSPs. Now, now I think, at least in, in, in some corners here in the Netherlands, we have to do with all those, and it has to be the private actors. So there's always a sense of magic thinking that we now find a solution of what is going to resolve all the problems. And sometimes when you read about these MSP constructions, they get that kind of aura. You have real believers in the MSPs that really feel like, okay, this is going to be the answer to everything that went wrong in development and is going wrong and will go wrong. Now, um, our findings don't collaborate, don't corroborate that. I mean, the legitimation effects we find and we dare to take some conclusions or how they come about, but at the same time, they were really modest. There are more sort of signs of a certain legitimation than you say, wow, this is spectacular. We are talking about findings like an NGO saying, oh yes, I have a much different relation with the state now. He phoned me last week and we had a really nice conversation. You know, it's, it's some more contact you have. It is a bit more of communication you have. And it is limited to some actors and perhaps not others. We call this the legitimation threshold and that is a very wicked mechanism. And I like to go back for this to uh, Joost, you, you, um, uh, Joost Andrissen this morning. He quoted Ashrani about, uh, his quote was that people know that the state is between them and the good life, basically, if I can paraphrase it in a very short way. And um, we recognized it. But there are also cases, and Beuger writes about this, where it is actually almost the other way around, where he says, there are lots of people that are very disconnected to the state, that have no expectations to the state, and have no willingness to contribute. So the question is how, how much people actually expect states to do. And we find some, I think in psychology you would call that cognitive dissonances, in the sense that people have a notion of state, what it should do, and at the same time in some places there is no way that they really expect the state to do it, 
this whole nice idea of the direct accountability, the direct root of accountability that comes with service delivery, that if people don't get the services they need, they will go directly to ask for them and setting sort of in motion the whole idea of the social contract. It, might, it may not happen. People just say, okay, what do you expect? It's the state. And we call it the legitimation threshold in a sense like, they're, if, they're, like if expectations and notions and experience with the state are, are below that threshold, you just don't see the kind of dialogue coming up that would result perhaps in better service delivery and in more legitimacy of the state. It's a bit of a wicked. And there's also something tautological in our findings, I find, in a way that in those MSPs where the state is behaving nicely, we see some positive legitimation effects, whereas where it doesn't, we don't see these effects. So it is, it, this, this threshold idea, it sort of keeps actors locked into a non-productive situation somehow when it comes to service delivery. Of course, there are personalized, uh, state services are quite personalized, which is another factor why there are no magic bullets. One is that uh, people who are with the state, state functionaries, they also have other roles in life. And uh, so it's also not sometimes clear whether they act on behalf of the state or on behalf of something else. And also state functionaries themselves may not feel that they are state functionaries so much. So they may not feel like I'm representing the state here and they may not do the PR that comes with it. Uh, for example, in Nepal, we found one case where it was like that, where there was uh, a district officer that said, I want people in the remote areas to think better of the state, so I only have now projects in remote areas. You know, a real proud state functionary that works and wants the state to, to sort of be advanced in the eyes of people. But we also find state functionaries that themselves are the state. I mean, who wants to, who wants to be with the state? I just happen to work for them, but... So that doesn't help, of course, in that sense either. And people take this, oh, that person is nice, but it doesn't mean that you get legitimacy of the state. And there's attribution problems in these MSPs. States often have a background role and people say, oh, it's the NGO who did the services. We also see a lot of that. Now, how nonetheless can this MSP make a difference for legitimacy? Again, not in terms of solving all the problems, but at least do a bit in the direction of what, we, what, what their donors hoped, is to address problems. Because MSP can also do something very wicked if people are being seen working together and they don't work together and they fight and they compete, it becomes very visible. So this MSP can also make problems visible that heretofore were invisible. And only when they are seen to address these problems, then you start to see some level of better communication. The second one is visibility, and that is almost a PR argument. I mean, if you see in, in programs where NGOs, international NGOs are involved and the state, and then you see these billboards, huge billboards of the NGOs, and then the state is nowhere to be visibly seen, and people often don't even perceive of the state to also be present in these initiatives. This is not a call for states to also put big billboards, if somebody would think that, but there should be uh, a slightly different way of advertising projects. And what we found very interesting is the notion of brokering state legitimacy. We tend to think of state legitimacy as something between the state and the people. Whereas if you, who is actually more bothered by the state? Is it the people or is it those people who are also engaged in service delivery and actually have to go to those offices, which are the NGOs, the local civil society, the active people. And there we see effects and that might be much more significant than the legitimacy at large. But you get some effects in these MSP. If the collaboration works well, you see actually improved state society relations at a very simple way between the different service providers in that village, in that area, that find each other easier and that get along better and that start to talk about each other slightly differently and with slightly more respect. Now, what are the policy challenges we get out of this? There are five. One is, of course, uh, the context analysis. Very interesting. I saw the New Deal that uh, uh, Joost Andriessen talked about. It was just uh, signed up in Busan and quite a landmark. And very interesting because it resonates pretty well with the things that we found. 
And it also starts with this notion, have a good context analysis. What are the sources of fragility? Where does it come from? Who's there? Who are the actors? And what is happening? Second, and that may be uh, slightly new to some of the conversations about this, don't only do your context analysis, but also in terms of what is there, but also in terms of how people see it. Consider expectations and perceptions. We just found them so important in all these MSPs that it's, it's very often not what is happening by the end of the day, but it's really how people perceive what is happening. It's not like objectively what the state does for you, but what do you see the state doing for you? And that so depends as well on what you expect from the state, your, 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 your previous experiences and all that. So somehow that has also to be taken into account when you plan these kind of projects. The third policy challenge, what is the role of state institutions? We have to ensure sufficient ownership of the different stakeholders. And of course, if, if there is a notion in the back of your mind that their state legitimacy is important, the state itself should have a proper role in this whole MSPs. And therefore, it is also good to bring these legitimacy questions and the responsiveness of states as part of the, of the objectives and of, of the planning and the design of these kind of arrangements. Now, the fourth policy challenge is how to give more attention to that process of stakeholder interaction. Now, it's always like this. When research is being done, it always piles up even more on the plate of policymakers. So now you have already done an inclusive MSP, and here come the researchers, and they say, okay, not enough. Now you have to make sure the process also works really well, as if they were not busy enough. So it's a bit of a tricky recommendation, of course, but nonetheless, um, it could make a really big difference. Well, the private sector in our cases was not very present, which is, an, in many cases, was a missed opportunity. And then, of course, it is about internal accountability information sharing. Now, our policy challenge around sustainability, we just have to go back to your question again, and we will do it somehow in this day as well, I hope. We like to get all your inputs there, the issue of cost recovery from two sides, the state and localised. Uh, the follow-up, is it the objective to actually institutionalize this arrangement, or is it just a one-off thing to get some water points in an area, which is also legitimate. You don't need to always set up an institution forever, but just be clear about that, and see how, how it is then embedded in these uh, institutional structures. I have led you into your coffee break now, um, which I think it's time for. I don't think there is time for a question now, eh, Diederik, I'm looking at you. Let's just have coffee. You deserve it.